Welcome back for the second serving of crimes that seem almost inhuman that took place this year, as well as the last episode for 2022. The closing of any year is a good time for reflection, and as we listen to the last sounds of the door creaking close on 2022, we will be taking a final look at what other atrocities people bestowed upon each other during the last 12 months. Those of you who listen to our episodes will know that the mirror we will be holding up to the passing year will not be one of those in clothing stores that make you seem skinnier than you are and convince you to buy a piece of clothing that, despite your better instincts, will make you look like a stuffed sausage. Oh no. Instead, we are holding up one of those facial mirrors you find at beauty salons that show every blackhead blemish, and burst blood vessel on the map of your face. While researching these cases, I myself found my mind bouncing around with facts so disturbing that it made me feel as if I was walking through a funhouse full of mirrors, meant to distort and morph your image. Regardless of perceptions of reality, here are the facts about the cases that made us, as a species, less civil than we might pretend to be. From all of us here at Human Monsters Podcast, we would like to thank each and every one of you who have listened and supported our passion project. We would like to wish every one of you a fantastic new year. Thank you for allowing us to have an audience for the work we do. At the end of the day, it's you, our listeners, for whom we research, create, and release every episode. We expect 2023 to be our best year ever, and with your support, we could not be in better company. Now, let's have a look at what some of the more than 8 billion people on this planet got up to this year. We begin with the case against James Jimmy David Russell who stands accused of the murder and cannibalism of 70-year-old David Flaggett. The 39-year-old believed that, by devouring his victim's brain and other parts of his body, it would cure his own disorder. This incident happened on the 21st of December, 2021, but there has finally been definitive evidence of cannibalism, which happens to carry a sentence of up to 14 years in prison in Idaho. He was deemed unfit to stand trial in October 2022. A 24-year-old woman faces charges of first-degree murder after she killed and decapitated a man with whom she had just had sex. Police in Green Bay, Wisconsin, say that they responded to a suspicious death notification. The woman, Taylor Business, dismembered her lover after a drug-fueled sexual exchange. She cut off his penis and head and placed both of them in a bucket. There has been no word on whether he was served up original recipe or extra crispy. Sorry, I couldn't resist. His legs would later be found in a crock pot. Police arrived in the early hours of the morning to find a gruesome scene. It appears that the 28-year-old victim and the accused were not in a relationship and that the crime happened at a third party's residence. The charges for the crime, which took place on the 2nd of March 2022, include committing intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, third-degree sexual assault, and resisting arrest. The man's head and penis were discovered by his mother after she had awoken from a loud sound outside her door. Apart from being the last person to have seen the victim alive, the murderess was covered in blood when police arrested her. According to Taylor's statement, she and the victim had been smoking meth all day and decided to engage in some S&M bondage sex. Taylor stated that, during the act, she started to choke the victim and somehow got entranced by the feeling 
of blood pulsing under her fingers as she choked him. She admitted to choking him to death with a chain, following up with acts of necrophilia. She claims that she wanted to take the entire body with her, but left the head and penis in the bucket behind because she became lazy. All school and mass shootings are tragic, and if we had to give each of the ones that happened this year alone our time, we would be here forever. I do believe that the crime that took place against the victims of the Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, deserves a mention, not only because of the very young age of the victims, but also the sheer number of people who perished in the attack. Salvador Reims, who is the perpetrator, was previously a student of the school. The 18-year-old man killed 19 students, two teachers, and severely wounded 17 others. Previously that day, he had murdered his grandmother by shooting her in the face. He left the body in the basement for officials to discover later. Due to the chaos of the attack, it appears that he could move freely from one point to another before the tactical unit intervened over an hour later. This is officially to date the third worst school shooting to take place within the borders of the United States of America. There has been an update this year in the case of a four-year-old little girl who was found beaten and drowned in a frozen lake in Missouri. The defendants, who claimed that the little girl had the devil in her, left blisters and bruises over her entire body, concentrated especially around her neck. While the exorcism was taking place, the little girl tried to run to her parents, but they were aiding and abetting the atrocities that had taken place for hours as she was slowly tortured to death. Four-year-old Jessica Mast was killed by her neighbors, who lived next door to the Mast family. They all went to the same church, and one of the neighbors had pled guilty to second-degree murder in March of this year. Eaton Mast, who just happened to share a surname with his victim, was not related and his live-in girlfriend, Courtney Almond, have been charged. Jessica's parents claim that everyone in their home was tortured by the neighbors, with the exception of a little baby. The crime took place two years ago to the month, and it was reported that James Mast, Jessica's father, informed emergency services that his daughter was dead. Police officers found the rural home in Coal Camp, and were greeted by an already deceased Jessica, covered from head to toe in open blisters and bruises. Her father openly admitted that their 36-year-old neighbor had beaten Jessica, submerged her in the freezing lake, and according to reports, the father did not call 911 until the child was dead. Both parents have also been criminally charged with the murder. Police, on discovering Jessica's body, also noted that her mother and two-year-old baby brother were covered in bruises. James claims that he had also been beaten during the two-week torture session that rained down on the family. Video cameras that showed everything that happened in James' house were discovered in Ethan's home. James claimed that his wife had been identified as being a demon and that both his children were possessed. Officers noted a lack of emotion in James when he made the call, and that God had spoken to him through the female neighbor, and that if he did not do as he was told, he would be punished. Officers responded to this by telling him that no God they knew would allow this to happen to any child. Or to quote Frank Zappa, Jesus thinks you're a jerk. A man has just been sentenced to 375 years in prison for the stabbing of two children and the execution-style shooting of a college student in New Jersey. The entire family of the victims were held hostage, bound, and tortured, all because the murderer did not like a Facebook post they made about him. 
The judge went so far as to call the defendant pure evil. Jeremy Arrington shot the female student while she begged for her life and stabbed the children as the other family members listened to their screams. Jeremy was known to the family for a long time. The mother of the two young children had made a Facebook post stating that Jeremy was wanted by the police. This was indeed true, as Jeremy was being investigated for a shooting and sexual assault charge against him. Jeremy, who already had a lengthy rap sheet, broke into the family's home on the 5th of November 2016 and tied up all nine occupants of the apartment, and for hours tortured them by stabbing them with kitchen knives. Seven-year-old Ariel Whitehurst and her 11-year-old brother, Elderon, did not survive the torture. Jeremy then shot and killed Shyasha McBurrows, who was just visiting the family. Police were notified of the attack when a little girl with autism in the home managed to escape, hide in a closet, and call 911. Jeremy tried to barricade himself in the apartment. Evidence indicated that the stabbings were so violent that the knife he used in the 11-year-old's murder broke off in his back. His claims were quickly dismissed, and judgment was served swiftly in this case. On the 9th of December, 2022, ex-Border Patrol agent Juan David Ortiz was given an automatic life sentence after the death penalty was taken off the table. The serial killer murdered four sex workers. Juan, who claimed to be afraid when he was arrested, left the discarded bodies on the side of the road to be discovered. He was arrested in a Texas hotel, and despite having a stellar military and work record, the ex-soldier received a life sentence for the murders. He was apprehended after a fifth woman escaped his capture, but considering the fact that he had 10 years of service at the Border Patrol, the actual number of victims is unknown. A Michigan man struck and killed an elderly woman while she was out on her walk to deliberately have sex with her corpse. 29-year-old Kobe Martin killed and raped the retired woman's corpse in February of 2022. Kobe, who was already facing charges of manslaughter and carrying a concealed weapon without a license, saw his victim, whose name is being withheld out of respect, and struck the woman with his car near the Oakland campground, dragged her body into a bush, and sexually assaulted her remains. So far during the investigation, police have found many images and searches for porn involving necrophilia. The case still has to come before the court. A case that might not seem as depraved or gruesome, yet captivated the world, was the escape of convict Casey White, with the aid of his girlfriend Vicki White, who happens to be the assistant director of detentions at the Lauderdale Detention Center. The two met when Casey was detained there and awaiting trial for two capital homicide cases. The two had started a romantic relationship, and despite his six foot seven inches frame and her petite blonde stature, the two believed they could get away with the escape on the 29th of April. They lasted one day and got 500 miles away before they crashed the car and Vicky impulsively pulled her gun on herself, whereupon she committed suicide. She later died in the hospital. Casey told investigators later that the two of them had made an agreement that she would kill herself and he would die by cop if they ever got caught. A grand jury has, however, indicted him on felony murder charges related to the escape. He is currently held in the Donaldson prison, where he is already serving a 75-year prison sentence with charges including kidnapping, attempted murder, and robbery. He is still a suspect in an unrelated murder charge of a woman named Connie Ridgway. What baffles Vicky's loved ones 
is that the escape took place the day after she signed her paperwork for her retirement and a month after she sold her house. Vicky and Casey could not be any more different in the question of why she risked everything she worked for her whole life just to give it up for this career criminal blows everybody's mind. A man suspected of the abduction and murder of an entire family of four, Jesus Manuel Salgado, was arrested for the kidnapping and murder of the family, which included an eight-month-old baby, appears to have worked for the family in their trucking business. Chilling video footage show the actual abduction of first the two adult brothers, then the young mother with her eight-month-old baby, eight-month-old Archie, her mother Jocelyn, her father Joshi, and her uncle Amal Dip Singh were presumably killed shortly after the abduction. Their bodies were found in an almond orchard in Southern California the following day, which was also when Jesus started to use his victims' debit cards for transactions. It appears that he has, apart from the crime in October this year, also tried a similar abduction but failed in 2005. Jesus has repeatedly tried to commit suicide and is still awaiting trial. In one of the most bizarre cases of the year, what is more than likely the oldest female serial killer has been arrested in Brooklyn, New York, after she had just been released from prison. 83-year-old Harley Marceline killed and dismembered her 67-year-old lover, Susan Lakin, and it appears that this is not her first murder. She was convicted in 1986 for the stabbing and murder of another woman. Susan was killed and dismembered, and her remains were placed in trash bags around the area. Surveillance footage clearly shows Harley riding on her scooter, sitting on one of her victim's legs, as she is in the process of disposing of Susan's remains. Susan and Harley met through an organization that provides services for the LGBT community. Whether Susan knew about the fact that Harley had spent almost 50 years of her life in jail for murder is unclear. The crime came to light after the torso was discovered. This will, however, not be Harley's first or second stint in prison. In 1963, she committed her first murder by stabbing her girlfriend to death. After serving her sentence for that crime, she was released in 1983, but almost immediately killed her living girlfriend again, but this time leaving her body in several places in Central Park. Susan's head was found in the apartment with a circular saw, which contained pieces of blood and flesh. She has so far refused to talk to police and has been indicted with first-degree murder. A couple who resided in the heart of New York has been accused of human trafficking. Kareem, who is 51 years old, and his wife Sharice, who is 38 years old, used the social service and foster care system to traffic underaged children in sex work. The couple had been accused of forcing at least eight women and children, of whom two came from the foster system, into prostitution. The operation has been running from the Bronx since 2018 and was only closed down in February of this year. Kareem has a criminal record with charges relating to his current charges, which begs the question whether background checks were done on these two people. Kareem used social media to meet his victims and would eventually intimidate and verbally abuse them into submission. The youngest of the women rescued was 18 years old, and the couple have pled not guilty, claiming the entire case is a conspiracy. A woman in Forest Hills, New York, has allegedly been murdered by her handyman, who also happens to be her lover. An argument ensued after the woman wanted to break their relationship off, and he did not. The violence, which began in the basement, culminated into him stabbing her to death while her 13-year-old son was sleeping upstairs. The killer then stuffed her body into a duffel bag that belonged to her son. 
or Celia Hall had been complaining that David Manolo had stalked her. The 51-year-old woman's body was found by a dog walker along Metropolitan Avenue and next to a park. He noticed the blood and contacted the police. Once the remains were confirmed as being that of a human in the duffel bag, officers literally followed a trail of blood from the dump site straight to her front door. The coroner would estimate that about 50 stab wounds were endured by the victim, and all that blood was attributed to officers being able to track it back to the crime scene almost a mile away. Only the 13-year-old son was at home, and police seemed to find it prudent to arrest him. He was, however, quickly released. The victim was married, but her husband and older son were away in Oregon, looking at possible choices for college. When David was arrested, he had cuts all over his hands and was heavily bandaged. He also left his bloody boots and a shirt in the park. He not only once, but twice, admitted that he committed this, this crime of passion, once to the police and once to the prosecutor. He had many books and videos about relationships and was convinced he could win her back. It appears that he is an illegal immigrant and that further charges should be expected. Another case that has finally reached a conclusion this year was the case of family annihilation, during which a wife, her three children, and the family dog lost their lives. The family did very well for themselves, with a home not only in Celebration, Florida, but in Connecticut. Anthony Tote was found in his home in Celebration in January 2021, living with the decomposing corpses of his wife, three children, and their dog, who all had died in December. He originally admitted to killing his family, but later retracted, blaming his wife, claiming she murdered their children and then herself. He cast himself as the sole survivor and a victim of the tragic event in his own right. Anthony, who had been a successful physical therapist, had, before the murders, been under investigation by the federal government and was about to be indicted for fraudulent medical billing. Anthony's wife's family were becoming concerned when, after Christmas, they had not heard from the family. It would emerge later that Anthony had spent approximately two weeks with the corpses, and despite numerous welfare checks, no foul play was expected. He told authorities when he was arrested that he had taken a lethal amount of medication and was rushed to hospital where he was stabilized. He killed his four-year-old daughter Zoe first by smothering her to death after administrating medication to make the kids drowsy. It appeared that he first tried to smother the boys as well, but underestimated their strength. 11-year-old Taylor and 13-year-old Alexander were both stabbed in the stomach, and his wife Megan was also stabbed. Signs clearly show that the boys were fighting back. In another of his confessions, he claimed his wife killed the children and then begged him to kill her, so he did. Another confession mentions a doomsday pact that Anthony and Megan had made to commit suicide as a family. The jury took six hours to find him guilty of all charges, and he will spend the rest of his natural life in prison. In Toronto, Canada, a 59-year-old homeless man has been killed by eight teenage girls. The girls, who range between the ages of 13 and 16, all appear to have met on social media. They all lived in different areas of the city and specifically got together to do what is commonly referred to as a swarming. The attack took place earlier this month in a plaza in full view of the public. Three of the girls are 13 years old, three are 14 years old, and two are 16 years old, when the group assaulted and killed the man, who remains unidentified. It is, however, known that he only recently fell on hard times and had to enter a homeless shelter. The weapons were dropped at the scene of the crime, and all were quickly arrested, as they made no attempt to escape or hide. The man died in hospital later that day from stab wounds.
In February of this year, a Lancaster female probation officer lost her life in a burglary. The woman was beaten to death by the intruder after the break-in. Officer Paula Lynn appears to have been living alone at her residence. Her body was discovered by police after the break-in was reported. The man who had bashed in Paula's head is homeless, and officers are still struggling to identify him. His charges include attempted sexual assault, murder, and sexual contact with the deceased remains. The case against Megan Hargan also concluded after five years in 2022. What originally seemed to be a murder-suicide eventually is found to be a double homicide. The motive was nothing more than jealousy and greed. Officers presumed that, when they arrived at the scene of the crime, that a daughter had killed her mother and then taken her own life in Virginia by shooting both of them. Megan, the other sister, was angry and upset that her mother was assisting her sister with the buying and financing of a home. Megan tried to conceal her crime by framing her sister. She accomplished this by leaving the 22 caliber gun in her sister's hand. Megan had also pretended to be her sister and texted her sister's boyfriend, but he knew from the beginning by the tone of the text that it wasn't her. As mentioned, the motive was that Megan believed her mother loved her sister more than her. The bodies of 37-year-old Helen Hartkin and her 63-year-old mother, Pamela Hartkin, were discovered on the 17th of July, 2017, in the home the sisters shared with their mother in McLean, Virginia. Megan and her 8-year-old daughter were both at home when the apparent murder-suicide occurred. From the start, Helen's gunshot wound did not seem self-inflicted. Megan not only called Helen's boyfriend, but also told police that Helen had been losing her mind. Megan also tried to make fraudulent bank transfers during this time. Megan was so eager to get a home for herself, she even made a bid for a house, despite only having $30 in her bank account. The case went to a grand jury, and she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Truck driver Wesley Brownlee has been officially charged with the murder of three people. The man who was on a mission to kill was finally arrested on the 10th of November after terrorizing the town of Stockton, California. On the 22nd of July, 2022, police discovered the body of 38-year-old Paul Yao in a park in Stockton. He had been fatally shot and did not seem to be aware that he was being targeted. His mother told authorities that he had no enemies and got along with everyone. A month later, on the 11th of August, 43-year-old Salvador de Beauty Jr. was fatally shot in a fast food restaurant's parking lot. He left behind a teen daughter, and his uncle is still in disbelief of his senseless act. Three more murders would follow. Jonathan Rodriguez, who was 31, was found deceased from gunshot wounds. 52-year-old Carranza was killed at a traffic intersection on the 21st of September. On the 27th of September, Lawrence Lopez Jr. was shot and killed. Wesley's modus operandi would be to just approach his target and kill the man at random on the spot. For months, the people of Stockton, which is in the valleys of California, were living in fear. Police knew they were dealing with a serial killer and that he needed to be stopped. The pattern was clear in that all the victims were murdered late at night or early in the morning, and that they were alone. It was also clear that robbery was not the motive. He has also been linked to murders in earlier years, and an attack that took place but failed in October. After reaching out to the community, tips started to come in about a certain man who resembled the identity and description of the assailant and police started to watch him. He was arrested after police, who were following him, realized he was on another hunt for a victim. Wesley had gotten out of his car and was clearly approaching a man, and police felt they could not take the chance. Police say that their success was as a result 
of the community being very forthcoming with any information they had about the killer. Authorities say more charges are likely to follow. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters in 2022. Happy New Year and bye for now.